Hey everyone, it's Sonia here. Now the truth is starting to come out about all kinds of different things, including, for example, a Rive can and also the trucker convoy. I talked about some of this in my previous live, but I wanted to go over it a bit more in detail now uh, where, I can, where I can show you the, um, the sources. So you can see that I'm not just making this stuff up. Although it is, sometimes it feels like this is one of those you can't make this stuff up kind of things. No, in fact, I'm not making it up. Um, before I start, I just want to say thanks for subscribing and for liking the video. And thank you for your support on Patreon. And also, I want to say especially thank you to those of you who donated to me on PayPal while I was out um, spending my life savings trekking around Europe. It was worth it, though. I did my retirement travel. Uh, thank you for those of you who donated. I had a lot of anxiety about my finances when I came back. I didn't dare even check my credit card statement until yesterday. Yeah, so I checked my bill and then I decided I got to get on with the business of paying my bills. And that included logging into uh, PayPal, which was another thing I'd been avoiding because I have login anxiety. And then I discovered that so many of you had donated while we were out in Europe. So I just want to say thank you. So there's three ways that you can donate if you want to support my channel. One is become a patron on Patreon. Um, two is with PayPal, cut out the middlemen. And three would be on YouTube through tips or super chat. So thank you to everyone who's been supporting my channel. I really appreciate it. Okay, so let's talk about this business with Canada. I mean, really, I'm just here to document this nonsense at this point. It's like the truth is coming out and I mean, we were angry before because we, we always thought this was bullshit and that they were misspending our money and doing all kinds of nonsense. But we were the bad guys. But now we're kind of vindicated. Um, I mean, I don't even have the energy to be angry anymore. But anyhow, here's the story. So you remember, the, of course, the famous uh, much loathed Arrive Can app, which is now no longer in use. Well, it's still in use, but it's voluntary. It's like a customs declaration app now. Um, the Arrive Can was basically used to screen out unvaccinated people so they couldn't come into the country or if they were Canadians, they'd have to quarantine on their return. And you know what? Our government spent $54 million on that app. Um, some uh, software developers held what they called a hackathon just to prove that there was no reason to spend $54 million on a RiveCan. And that it could have been made quickly and easily. And they basically were able to clone this app or make a similar app over the course of a weekend. And like literally a one individual could create this app over the course of a weekend by themselves. So it was like, why would you spend $54 million on this? And um, PAX News has conveniently broken that down for us, how the ArriveCan app went from costing 80000 which was the original cost, to $54 million. Wow, that's a big difference. 80000 to $54 million. So what it comes down to basically is that, of course, it's not just the app. It's the whole surveillance operation, including all the call centers. Uh, there was, had to be somewhere for people to call to ask the, all the stupid questions they had to have about the stupid arrive can. And then, of course, they had to have all these people working in call centers to call people to check if they're doing their quarantine. 80000 for the initial version, 7.5 listed for the call center answered more than 645,000 calls on COVID health measures, uh, 5.2 million on data management, 4.9 on indirect costs associated with the project, um, 4.6 to authenticate and verify travelers' proof of vaccination credentials. That almost costs as much as that big ring that they put downtown in Montreal. Um, building and maintaining IT systems for supporting border health measures was 4.5 million. Oh, 4.5 million for tech support for travelers, 2.3 for cybersecurity, 1.7 to ensure the app was accessible for users with disabilities, 1.6 for internal project management costs, and 3.8 budgeted as a contingency fund. And plus, ArriveCan listed a $1.2 million payment 
to a tech company that never actually even worked on the app. The company called Think On was listed as having received contract work of over a million dollars related to ArriveCan, but the CEO says they never worked on it. He said, we have received no money from the CBSA. So they didn't receive any money and they didn't work on the app. Why are they on the list? Who knows? CEO doesn't know. I think the amount of money they attributed to us was probably more than our total revenue generated within the federal government in the last fiscal year. Also, GC Strategies received the most money for working on ArriveCan at $9 million. As it so happens, their company has no office and less than five employees and instead subcontract work to over 75 other private entities, which the federal government says it cannot reveal. So when it comes to ArriveCan funding, the government was basically handing out money like it was the Oprah Christmas special. And then they won't tell us who they actually gave that money to. That was a very, very expensive venture. I hope it was worth it. Turns out, actually, probably not. Journal de Montréal has reported COVID-19, travel restrictions had small impact on virus spread, report says. So there was a report put together, which was called Lessons Learned, Accessing Canada's Pandemic Border and Travel Requirements, for physicians specializing in infectious disease management, emergency medicine, and pandemic management, stated that government-imposed health restrictions at borders have proven ineffective in protecting people from the spread of the virus and its variants. And uh, here is the document itself, Evaluating Canada's Pandemic Border and Travel Policies, Lessons Learned. Yeah, I hope they learn their lessons and I hope they remember them. Um, on page five, here's the executive summary. I think it's worth reading this. So after studying these measures extensively, this is what they discovered. This is what the experts discovered. Wait, no, I don't think it's against YouTube's guidelines to say that ArriveCan didn't prevent uh transmission or variants or whatever. No, I don't think they mentioned that. Have to be careful because there are these experts who are commissioned by the government to write reports and do investigations. And then there are the experts at YouTube who supersede um, the experts that work for the government, I guess. The report, the evaluating Canada's pandemic border and travel policies. Lessons learned report was commissioned by the Tourism Industry Association of Canada in partnership with the Canadian Travel and Tourism Roundtable. Four Canadian doctors with infectious disease and pandemic management experience assess the impact and effectiveness of border measures and other travel restrictions introduced by the Canadian government to manage the COVID-19 pandemic. So that was mostly not letting unvaccinated people into the country and quarantining Canadians who were uh, returning but unvaccinated. Oh yes, and the testing, that, that was another thing. Through a study of existing literature and best practices from Canada and internationally, the report concludes that border measures have been ineffective at stopping variants of concern from entering and spreading across Canada and are unlikely to be effective in the future. At best, travel restrictions are estimated to delay the impact of a variant of concern by a few days. Two, there is no convincing evidence that pre-departure and on-arrival testing, the latter currently being randomly imposed on travelers, and surveillance have a sizable impact on the local transmission in our communities. Three, pre-departure and arrival testing are ineffective in identifying COVID-19 cases and preventing the spread of the virus and should no longer be imposed. Open data sharing and community wastewater testing are easier surveillance mechanisms to identify variants without inconveniencing travelers 
and requiring significant government and industry resources. So what a waste of money, I guess. Lessons learned only took two years and millions and millions of dollars. So the Arrive Can, the $54 million for Arrive Can, that was only part of it because that doesn't even include all this testing. Anyway, I hope that they have learned their lesson. Okay, here's another thing. Um, I mentioned this in my live as well, but I really want to show you where it came from. CSIS memo rejects Trudeau's Freedom Convoy swastika narrative. So apparently CSIS had investigated during the convoy to see um, whether there really were right-wing extremists, extremists or Nazis, uh, whether they were representative of the protesters who gathered in Ottawa, and they concluded that they were not representative and represented a very small portion of the crowd. And they said that there were a number of small flags reflecting racist and bigoted worldviews, but this is not unique to this event and is seen often at anti-lockdown events across the country. Agents also acknowledge that many protesters added swastika to their flag, not necessarily to self-identify as Nazi, but to imply the prime minister and federal government were acting like Nazis by imposing public health mandates. That's something that people who had been there had known all along. Apparently, CSIS knew too. What happened? Trudeau didn't get the memo? I mean, literally didn't get the memo. And they concluded the service is unaware of the presence of ideologically motivated extremist groups at this weekend's protest. Freedom of expression is constitutionally protected in Canada. So, I mean, I had gone down there to check it out myself and I knew that it wasn't a bunch of Nazis running around. There were people from all kinds of backgrounds and races and everything. And yet uh, in the parliament, Trudeau was accusing people of standing with people who waved swastikas if they supported um, the protest, including Jewish MP Melissa Lansman from Thornhill, Ontario. And we had to watch this bullshit unfold. And unfortunately, we had to watch a lot of people that we know fall for it and believe it when we knew that that absolutely didn't make any sense. And now apparently it turns out CSIS also knew. And the convoy money didn't come from foreign actors, according to CSIS. Remember that whole thing about it was being funded by foreign sources and maybe it was the Russians. Well, the CSIS director's account of extremists was at odds with the government's rationale for triggering the Emergencies Act. <laughs> So although millions of dollars in donations to the convoy came from outside of Canada, CSIS told officials during the protests that the money did not appear to be coming from foreign states or foreign actors. There are no foreign actors identified at this point supporting or financing the convoy. FinTrack is supporting this work assessment and the banks are also engaged. So FinTrack was tracking the money and CSIS had not seen any foreign money coming from other states to support this. There's not a lot of energy and support from the USA to Canada. Interesting. Because they made it sound like it was sort of an extension of the Trump supporters that were somehow fueling this. Or maybe the Russians. Well, apparently not. So basically, this was all a bunch of bullshit. It was a bullshit narrative. We knew that. We, we called it out and people just said that we were uh, part of the problem. Turns out we were right. <laughs> Anyhow, um, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to give you this update. Uh, we'll leave it at that. So a lot of the stuff that, yes, we've been calling out as BS this entire time, turns out absolutely it was BS. It's hard to understand also how they kept Arrive Can going for so long when there was so much evidence coming out that it wasn't solving the problem. It wasn't actually accomplishing anything. And other countries had dropped their entry restrictions. And yet Canada kept it going. I always said that I think it had more to do with um, 
digitalizing and modernizing travel, which the Canadian government had also admitted on the Arrive Can website. They said it. That's where I got it from. And that was in connection with the known traveler digital identity program, which I've spoken about many times. And I think that's what this was really about. And the question now is, well, why hasn't the U.S. dropped their entry requirements? I mean, they're really late to the party at this point. They should probably maybe update their guidelines in accordance with following the science uh, as opposed to the politics. I really can't understand why they're still keeping it going, but they must have some reason for doing it. So I'm looking forward to them dropping it. And that's it. Let me know what you guys think. Thanks again for your support. And it was nice to see you in the chat. And God bless you guys. And thanks for listening to me. And I'll see you next time.